since the mid 90s. Uh, and, I, and I threw a, a credit in one of these slides to my, my now retired colleague, there it is, he's not on here, Dr. Ken Hunt. And Dr. Ken Hunt at, at our Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center established our pecan germplasm work, our walnut germplasm work, and our chestnut germplasm work. The, the walnut work has been taken over by, by Mark Cogsell, who was going to give this talk, but is busy doing field work. Uh, so, one of the things that's needed, you know, I listen to the talks and I hear the same themes over and I just, I'm always nodding yes because we're learning that, we're, we're beginning to hone in on the things we need to know in many, many facets of agroforestry that people bring up. So one of the things that everyone wants to know is, well, how, how do these, cult, which cultivars are really good and how do you know that and do you have replicated trials over time? And in most cases, the answer is we don't have any of that stuff. Got to, you know, it's doing this way with Greg Miller and that way with Tom Wall and this way with us and so it's somewhere in Florida, but not replicated trials like that. So this is some data that we have from three and four years of replicated work that I wanted to share with you today and uh, co-authors of uh, Mark Cogsall, uh, my former colleague who's now at North Dakota State, uh, Ina Chernushka, and Jerry Van Sambeek who worked with us on this also from the U.S. Forest Service. Um, so just a quick run through, uh, just to be typically just a couple slides, issues with specialty crops, cultivar versus seedling, a quick look at the U.S. chestnut industry, overview a slide of our work, and then get to hear the, the trial and discussion on rainfall, diameter, yield, and nut size. So one of the issues that agroforesters face, and you hear a lot about this with hazel, uh, but all the other crops, that farmers want to plant these specialty nut crops uh, because there's market opportunity and people are hearing about all the great things. But in a lot of cases, there's a lot of risk there because the information, the sound information, the long-term testing, the multi-site testing, uh, uh, the quality germplasm isn't available in, in, for most growers. And so you're, you're, you might be putting in inferior material, and if you put in inferior material, you set yourself back for a very long time unless you're willing to basically cut the top off and re-top work it and graft it. For a lot of crops, we don't have detailed financial decision-making information, and you need that to really round out a full enterprise. And then, uh, I use this word a lot, lack knowledge networks, lacking who knows what in the support infrastructure for harvesting and processing, et cetera. These are things that are not that well known for crops when you get away from something like pecan. So we don't have it for hazel, we don't have so much for chestnut, we don't have it so much for elderberry, and then you get into aronia and it gets even, you know, more, more dicey. Uh, California is all cultivars. Uh, Michigan's fruit, uh, Florida's fruit, um, New York's fruit, it's all cultivars. There's no such thing as seedling apples. There's no such thing as seedling peaches. There's no such thing as seedling pears. You buy Bosque pears, Anjou pears, Macintosh apples, you name it, you buy cultivars. Because the growers want to know exactly how they're going to perform. But in the Midwest with our nut crops, it's almost all seedlings. You know, uh, pecans are native, black walnuts are native, and the industry, at least in the upper Midwest, has developed uh, on, on, on wild nuts. But, but I think that over time, if our industry is going to grow in the eastern U.S., it's also going to be based on cultivars like they do with pecan down south and not wild crops. Chestnuts, we now have a couple hundred acres as of the two, 2012 census. Uh, a little bit of improved pecan and black walnut, just essentially nothing. There's going to be some great stuff coming out of the center's uh, walnut improvement program and compare all that, you know, we're talking about, um, uh, where's my number here on acreage? I don't see it. Ah, 16,000 acres and mostly wild, and here's California, 245,000 acres of English walnut only, not almond, not pistachio, etc. So it's a different order of magnitude. There's some good things about cultivars. Uh, they're very predictable in performance because these are asexually propagated. 
form, pollen production, yield, nut size, harvest date, post-harvest storage. So when you get a row of a particular cultivar, all the trees behave almost exactly the same because they're clonally produced. Grafted signwood is mature and it initiates nut production sooner than seedlings. So you can think about the specific traits of your tree. I want this to be early bearing. I need this for this pollination time. I need this for this size of a nut. And so you can also then create and replace orchards from your own signwood. So once you've got that initial investment, you're all set. Uh, problem with seedlings, some of them. Commercial production, it takes longer, especially, you know, for example, the chestnuts. And you definitely have variability. You don't know what you're going to get. So if I fathered 100 children, they're not going to look alike. And if you take 100 seeds off a chestnut and plant out 100 chestnut seedlings, they're not going to look alike. And you're, so you're just upping your risk. Okay? And the same thing about nut quality. Seedlings may produce nuts that are inferior to the mother tree that's grafted. They might be better, but for many growers, they don't want to be experimenters. They actually want to go into production. Okay? Cultivars are more expensive, but I think you make the cost back because every tree is a winner, 100% of them. Okay? They do die, but you can re-graft them, and even with some graft failure, you're way ahead financially over time. Cultivars are less vigorous, so you need to know what you're doing. You have to have better orchard care. Uh, seedlings are more vigorous, grow much larger, tolerate less ideal sites, but my thought is if the sites aren't good enough for cultivar production, perhaps chestnuts shouldn't be your business. Okay? It can be your hobby, but maybe not your business. Here's a nice slide from Michigan State showing the difference, same age. Uh, there's a, a colossal cultivar there on the right and a 10-year-old seedling on the left. Six years, tons of burrs, 10 years, nothing yet. Okay? And you don't want to be in the market of having nothing yet. And not only that, you don't know what you're going to get. Okay? Our program has a lot of things going for it, very comprehensive, but I'm not going to talk about most of that today. So we are developing and testing cultivars. We're working on orchard production, management, and harvest techniques, market and consumer research. We're in trying to increase consumer awareness and demand, and we also train growers, and we're exploring co-op production to develop the industry in the region. But I just want to talk about the first point. So just a couple things about a chestnut industry. Things we already know. Full-time U.S. chestnut growers are in the enviable position of demand outstripping supply, and Tom Wall has already talked about that. It's everyone that you talk to who's a serious grower. Uh, you get high prices, and our industry is growing because there's now, since 2007, the U.S. Ag Census has begun to track chestnut production. So we have two periods, 2007, 2012, and the acreage in Missouri doubled over that five-year period. Just a couple notes here. This is the census from 2012. Uh, we have 3,784 acres around the whole U.S., 2,400 bearing, uh, 1,300 hour bearing. So if I just took this number, 2,400, if you averaged uh, 500 pounds an acre, we'd have a 1.2 million pound national industry. If it averaged 1,500 pounds an acre, we'd be at 3.6 million pounds. So our, our total production is probably somewhere in that, in that range nationally. Out west, they can do 5,000 pounds on an acre in California, but a lot of the orchards in the east probably do 500 pounds. Okay? Some of the things we know, and uh, these, are some, these are some chestnuts from, uh, from our farm from, from last fall. This is a cultivar we're going to put into tr production that hasn't been there yet called Sago. But, so we know that the Chinese chestnut grows well in our region in many areas. You have to have the proper soil in sight. Wet feet is deadly because of Phytophthora. Uh, annual yields on selected cultivars is quite good, over 40 pounds, 20 kilos, and it assumes good management. And we think irrigation is real important because the nuts, if you want larger nuts, they size up in July and August, and at least in Missouri, we get that high pressure heat bubble, and in a lot of summers, the heat goes up, the rain turns off right at the time when the nuts would like to size up. Okay? Direct to market retail wholesale prices are high, two to four dollars a pound wholesale, 450 to eight retail. There are hobby growers who undercut the price, and I never like to see that, but it does happen. 
you have to have a quality product for market growth and you also have to harvest frequently because chestnuts are 50% moisture, so you have to get them out of the orchard right away and get them to refrigeration. Okay? We are currently recommending probably about seven cultivars of 65 we have under test at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center. Most of these are not commercially available even if you want them. Um, the Forest Keeling Nursery now sells, they come in our orchard and they take our cyan wood and propagate that so they know what they're getting. Um, consumers are receptive when exposed to chestnuts and there's no question because we, you know, so many people have done this study and we've done and published a market study that there's a 15-fold preference over locally grown chestnuts compared to chestnuts from abroad. That's, that's a big deal, All right? So we have, we have four studies. We have this oldest repository with all these cultivars. We have this trial, which I'm going to talk about, 12 cultivars, five reps, established in 99. We have a commercial orchard. We have a pollen flow study. All, of, all these have been molecularly fingerprinted, and we replaced one of the one of the ones in our commercial orchard after a few years, Willamette, because it turned out that once it started to get into high production, the nut size really crashed. And as I said, all these were established by our colleague, Kent Hunt. So this is at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center, uh, 30 miles west of Columbia and uh, very close to the Missouri River. Established in 99, beautiful soils. This is, this is the part of Missouri that is like Iowa. Okay, this is a band of hills along the Missouri River from St. Joe to St. Louis, right close to the river, has 60, 80 feet deep lush soils, but very erodible, perfect for perennial tree crops. Um, most of what we're growing is Chinese chestnut, Castania melissima, but we also have some hybrids. Uh, again, 11 cultivars, five reps, 30 by 30 foot spacing, and this is data pretty much collected between 2008 and 2011. So there's, there's the state of Missouri, the outlying properties for the university, and we're sitting right there in Howard County and Columbia, Missouri is there in, in Boone County. It's an aerial shot of, of, of uh, our Huck Farm. This is actually Missouri River floodplain, and here you're up in hills, you know, 60, 80 feet above the floodplain, and it's very deep soil. So we've got walnut trials on the farm, we've got pecan trials down in the floodplain, and we've got four different chestnut plantings. The one I'm gonna talk about is just that one right there. But, okay, so that's just a quick look at the various cultivars, including some that are in the border that we didn't study. So Eaton, Amy, Colossal, Sleeping Giant, Ching, et cetera, and I'll show you some data. That's what the, that's what the uh, cultivar trial orchard looks like. So we collected uh, rainfall totals by month and also by crop phenology. Uh, we got average yields, average nut weight, and diameter. And we're very interested to track rainfall during nut fill because as I said, the nuts size up in July and August. And so if you're in a climate where you always have good rainfall in July and August, you probably don't need to worry about irrigation. But we always tell people when, in the growers in Missouri, get irrigation set because when we get those drought years, you're gonna want it for tree health, okay? So again, you can see that 2007 was a dry year. Eight, nine, and 10 were above average, and 2011 started out good. We started to get into the 2012 drought, in fact, at the end of 2011. Uh, but the, the trees grew really well now. So these trees averaged eight to 12 years old from graft during this study. So between 2007 and 2011, uh, most were about three times as large in diameter. They were growing fast. They're really cranking it out, okay? Let's look at uh, average nut yield in kilograms across the different years. And so one of the things that I really want to show you is not only are there major differences among cultivars, and I'll show you that more graphically in a minute, because you can see that there's significant difference letters all the way across, but Look what happens between the, the time the trees are nine and 10. So the question is, when do these things come into commercial production? Okay, so pick a cultivar. I circled a few. Colossal jump from 24 to 40. Mossbarger from five to nine. Uh, Willamette from two to seven, and then again to 11. Most of these from seven to 24, 11 to 21, 18 to 20. So it's the nine and 10 year, there's the data, where they really jump, five minutes, okay? 
And again, you, want to, you wonder if there's a lot of variation. Average yield range 42 uh, kilograms for colossal down to six for peach, which has nice sized nuts, but very low yield. Okay? Same thing with average nut weight. There's quite a bit of variation, and let me just uh, show you three are average in grams. These are pretty jumbo sized nuts, 16, 15 grams, and a lot of the nuts are actually bigger than that since an average, so it ranges from 16 down to 10 grams. That's also important. So just kind of final evaluations. In this E and J, instead of using Latin names, that means European, Japanese, Chinese, and the K somewhere is Korean, okay? So some things about Colossal, high nut yield, big size, a West Coast favorite, Michigan likes it, but we worry that it might get blight because it is European, Japanese, we haven't seen it yet. Ching does really well, yields high, pure Chinese, uh, but we do have some graph failure, but even so, if you take good care of it, we think it's our best cultivar. Uh, Amy is high yield and small nut size. I used to think small nut size was really a problem, but knowing that Tom Wall sells to Bosnians who are all asking for as many small size nuts as possible, there's a market. And now that we have a commercial machine to pick them up rather than by hand, it's not a problem. It used to be a pain. I won't finish the sentence. Just a pain, okay? Things like Auburn Homestead, it tends to drop in the burr. So some of the chestnuts, the burr opens up and the nuts drop free. Uh, homestead, the burr falls to the ground and then matures a little more. So when we would hand harvest, you have to kick it open. But with our, with our mechanical harvester, you, it sucks it up and it separates the burr from the chestnut. So that's great. Peach has beautiful chestnuts, low yield. Willamette, the size really dropped after it started to get to commercial size production. Okay, so data on chestnut cultivar performance is lacking, but here are some. Uh, the multi-year cultivar trial revealed significant difference for diameter, nut size, and yield. Dramatic increase between eight and nine. That's kind of the magic time, I think. Uh, our information is used as a basis for cultivar recommendations in Missouri and surrounding states, and hopefully with some good fortune in the grant world, we'll have more regional trials in the near future. And we do have all kinds of other materials, like nutrition information and growing guides, and voila. Okay? So I've been really grappling with this issue between cultivars and seedlings, just trying to figure out exactly what I think about, you know, the differences and ultimately no matter what, a tree is going to be more resilient during, you know, climate change issues. Um, than say an annual crop. But I'm curious, um, at, at a certain point, do you think a seedling is gonna win out, you know, in terms of helping us adapt to climate the, 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 um, n No, I, I, but what, what would be nice is if, is if for all these different crops, we were able to figure out uh, inexpensive mass production ways to root the cultivar. Oh, yeah. Right? So then you have exactly what you want and you propagate it without having to worry about a graft union. Yeah. One of our favorite cultivars was called Eaton. And at about age seven, beautiful favorite, good yield, beautiful nuts, etc. we started to see graft failure, but you can't even tell why. All you can see is that there's a whole bunch of catkins that are up there dead on top. And uh, th there's no sprouting, there's no swelling. You know, we've tried to look and see, is it a virus? We couldn't find it. Is it a fungus? We couldn't find it. So it's a mystery, and it's a bummer, because we took it off our good list. It's, off, it's on Santa's bad chestnut list right now for us, just because, it, and we don't know why. If we, if we knew the answer, then we could put it back in. But right now, we, we're backing off from Eaton. Do you have a question? question along that line of the delayed graft failure. Just some of the chestnut growers that I've been talking to throughout the U.S. seem to have differing rates of delayed graft failure. Some of them didn't have any. Some of them had, you know, maybe only 20% mm -hmm. survival with their graft trees. So why does it, does that have to do with, you know, maybe it has to do with site selection. Maybe it has to do with what state and climate they're in. But are there any ways that we could maybe you know, modify that? Well, the, the type of that you use? Huh? Repeat the, I'm sorry. Repeat the question. 
Um, so, there, so there are different rates of graft failure all around the country, and there's a number of factors. Certainly if you're not on the right soils and you're not in the right site, you're stressed right away. And if you don't, if there's competition, more stress, et cetera. So you, you need to have good orchard management techniques because the ones that are really well tended tend to fail very, very little. Even, even Ching fails very little if you really do it well. And so it's interesting because one of the, the things that I learned from Ken Hunt is that if you actually grow out the rootstock until it's say thumb size and you have and you're able to do your own field grafting you have a higher success in the long term of that graft than if you buy a grafted tree and stick it in the ground though most people will because they're very sensitive that first year when you buy a grafted seedling but if you have something that's very robust there it tends to do better if you have good grafting skills if you actually field graft so if you have that skill it's also much cheaper um, and then once you get the cultivars, uh, you know, grafted on there, you can, mul you can, so you only need to buy a couple cultivars and you can, but part of the problem is people don't want to wait. This is, you know, it's, I'm saying eight or nine years. That does add another couple more years because you got to put, start that small, it grows up another year, and then you graft and it takes a while. Which graft would you recommend you still? Uh, uh, both. The, the whip and tongue works well, and then Ken calls it a banana graft. Is there another name for the banana graft? Four flat, three flat, three flat graft. Other questions? We're close to the end of the day. Donna? Did you have any question? Where do we get the grafted or the cutting? Well, so, so grafted. The, there, so there's a nursery in Ellsbury, Missouri that I mentioned in there called Forest Keeling, and they sell our stuff. They sell, they get, they buy cyan wood from us, so it's true to type, and they're pretty much trying to only sell the ones that we have put on the good list. Sleeping Giant and Ching. Uh, we didn't have Gideon in the test, but yeah, so there's a few, and 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 they're actually going to graft up this sago for me and we're going to add it into our production orchard so we can take a look at a larger number of plants over time. Uh, you know, there's uh, chestnut blight in our orchard and we, we did grow some of what I call West Coast cultivars, Bouche de Betazac, Marjul, uh, Marsal, etc. that are more Japanese uh, uh, European hybrids just to see how they would do because why not check it out? And uh, almost all of them eventually have died of blight. But I'm happy to see blight there because that means that all the other ones that are thriving and surviving and bl blight-free are blight-free. So, you know, bring on the blight. Uh, yeah. That's just the way it goes. And, and also, now that we've got 18 years and we've had super hot summers, uh, 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 super cold winters, etc. The ones that have thrived, which is almost all of them, I'm very confident that they're going to do well. So bring on 40 degrees below zero. I don't care. I want to see that one in 15, 20 year super extreme. And if the trees make it, no problems. You know, you're going to make it all the time for all the growers in the region. Steve. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, did you talk about troubles? No. <laughs> I didn't talk about truffles and chestnuts. Uh, I, I, I was asking Jerome, actually, Kirion. I was just, he, we were just talking about that. I think that's it. And so here's the, here's the conundrum. Uh, I don't know that you can grow the European truffle on a chestnut because the European truffle likes a pH like 7.5 and up. Chestnut likes a pH 6.5 and down. I don't think they're happy to try to force them one way or the other. Uh, but, he, but, but Jerome is, developed, is looking at some native truffle, at least in Quebec, that, that he thinks are really quite good in a sensory sense, in a, in a culinary sense, that he feels may have potential. I'm all over that. If that's a possibility and you could have chestnuts above and truffles below, if I were a rich man, you'd be in good shape. <laughs> other questions? Yes. Uh, have you done any looking, because we just heard the culinary qualities of the hazelnuts, have you done any looking at the culinary qualities of these different? Uh, 
M Michelle Warman actually d did did pu publish on that. Um, to our surprise, and, and still Tom won't, won't believe it, but th we, there's, a, there's a group in Kansas State that's similar to the North Carolina folks that do the, the taste testing. And, and so they tested, I'm not sure we got everything exactly on par, but they actually liked uh, the Colossal, which many people in the Chinese chestnut world feel is the red delicious of chestnuts. And everybody knows what that means. But they, they actually rated that as a, as a better tasting chestnut than the Chinese. Uh, but the, I think if you're used to that, that's what the taste is that you expect. People that like Chinese eat colossal and they go, something's wrong. It's, not, it's typically not as sweet. And the only opinion that matters is the people who buy chestnuts. <laughs> yeah. So, but we, we have no problem whatever selling our Chinese chestnuts. I mean, again, what's really important at this point is that we're in this, we're in this good part of the the cons all the consumers work that we've done, the more people are exposed to chestnuts, the more they go in and buy a couple of pounds. Right now, the average American buys, say, over, overall per capita, say a tenth of a pound. If we move that up to a pound, we've just increased the market in the United States tenfold. So once we get past the, the Asians and the Europeans who grew up with them, and we're going to John Q and Jane Q American, whatever that means, uh, then the market is going to grow, and those, and that's happening with with our chestnut roast and a lot of other events, and more and more take. Okay, with that, let's give Mike another.